Hello, Business Jet Traveler readers and friends, and thank you for joining us. Our goal here today is to help you learn everything you need to know about chartering a private plane. You may be considering it for the first time, or you may have already taken several flights, but either way, we hope to be of service to you today. And our hope is that at the end of this webinar, you could book a, your first charter flight as early as this afternoon. So, um, and quickly before we start, I just wanna give a few reminders. One is we will be sending you a recording of this webinar as well as a copy of the slides tomorrow. Um, and also as you leave, you will see a short survey and I know time is tight, but if you do have the time to fill out that survey, we would appreciate it very much. And most importantly, um, please ask questions throughout the um, presentation. We will answer them as they come in. And um, I want to emphasize that when it comes to flying privately, there is no such thing as a stupid question. Every question is valid. And um, if you're thinking it, there's probably 10 other people who are embarrassed to ask that question. So please ask it. Um, we will see as we go on through this uh, webinar that asking a lot of questions is actually the most powerful tool that you have when it comes to um, business aviation or getting started in business aviation. So before we start, we're just gonna start with a poll. Um, and the question is, when it comes to charting an aircraft, the area where I have the most concerns and questions. And Charlie, it looks like people yeah. don't know who Paul, I don't understand how the pricing works. We're going to go over it. I can understand that. <laughs> yeah, pricing is a really big question, and we have focused on that today. It's a bit of a how long is a piece of string type issue because uh, okay. transparency is the big, the big um, issue that has to be resolved there. What's included, what isn't. That's correct. And. Um, you know, it's just it's not it's not as easy to figure out. Obviously, yeah, it looks like looks like yeah. pricing is the number one concern there. Don't know who to call. We're definitely going to be addressing that and how to call them. Yes, how do we know if a company is legitimate? Very reasonable question. Yes. Okay. Well, um, Let's get started. I am excited to welcome my BJT colleague, Charles Alcock, to this panel. And together, we would like to welcome Para Martheson, CRO and co-founder of the Avenode Group, and also Michael Ryan, who is a frequent charter customer and owner of Air PSG. And you actually might even recognize Mike's byline. He has written a couple of guest articles for BJT that were very popular. So we're very excited to have both of you gentlemen here with us today. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, this, just in case anybody isn't sure, this is how you ask questions to connect with our panelists. You just use the question box in the control panel. All right, so Charlie, let's begin. Um, we're seeing many people who are entering the space flying privately for the first time because of the pandemic actually. Um, this is a, it's understandably overwhelming and intimidating. There are tons of options available. Um, so can you get us started? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, the good news is there is fantastic choice out there. There's, there's a, a dazzlingly large array of companies who can provide you with a private flight. The question is, how are you going to access them? And in some respects, this comes down to what type of a consumer are you? Are you the person who just wants to express your desire and have somebody else figure out all the important details for you? Or are you somebody who thinks, actually, I know best and I trust my instincts when it comes to shopping around for, for any type of service or, or commodity? Now, you can look for, of course, these days in, in the age of the internet, you can simply go and ask Dr. Google to give you, give you a set of aircraft operators. We've provided a list here of some of the companies that we're more familiar with. It's absolutely not exhaustive, but that's one way to start, just searching online. I would suggest that actually there is expertise out there that's worth going to, and one source of that are what are called brokers. 
Now, in some respects, you can think of a broker as a little bit like the best of an old school travel agent, somebody who is well connected, who has a lot of knowledge and, and who can really cut to the chase and help you turn this confusing array of choices into a set of choices that is more relevant to your situation. So it is well worth going to a broker. And if you get the right one, we've listed, humbly suggested some good ones here, they can really add a lot of value in terms of, of cutting through these questions that you need to ask and assessing your needs and getting bids and, and, and options for you that are as close to your needs as possible. Now, there are also some ways of using private aviation that involve making a bigger commitment, signing up to some form of, of membership program or, or uh, jet card program where you're saying, okay, I'm willing to do this in more than just a one-off way and I'm willing to sign up for a program such as Wheels Up or to use a, a jet card provider. And you will often get that way, you know, perhaps better flight hour rates. We'll talk about pricing in a moment. But of course, you are then making a commitment. And sometimes that commitment comes with extra rewards. Um, then there, there are various companies you who are now are offering. To, um, Charlie, excuse me, but a yes, broker would help you sort through. So in column one, a broker would help you sort through all of these operators and what the differences are. Yes, they would. Yes, that's right. They, a good broker would ask you the right questions and would pair you up, would kind of match make you with the right type of operator for you. And then, of course, there's an option which we call seat sharing. Now, this is this can be a little bit confused, confusing, but there are companies who are basically providing aircraft that they're that they're opening up to to multiple possible uh, passengers. Pear, perhaps I could just quickly ask you, what do we really mean by seat sharing? Could you help me define that? Yeah, it's basically traveling on a private jet, uh, but you're just booking one or several seats. And as you said, there could be multiple parties uh, traveling uh, that you're not aware of uh, previously on the same aircraft. Uh, so think of it almost like flying commercial, but with all the benefits of the private jet experience in terms of showing up 20 minutes before a smaller plane, getting closer to, to airports uh, that you would not, normally not be able to travel with uh, commercially. Absolutely. And and uh, of course, later we'll get into the business of how are these flights offered in a legitimate way that, that meets all the rules. But you're right, that is a good option. Um, other things to be aware of, and we'll get into this in our in our uh, vocabulary break in a minute, but it's, you know, it's you really need to keep in mind when you're booking a flight, uh, you are essentially booking a one-way flight unless you've agreed otherwise from point A to point B. So unless you've specifically booked a round trip, the assumption is generally going to be that's what you're booking. So then comes the question of, well, who's playing, paying for the aircraft to return to wherever it was that it started? And I think it's fair to say that generally speaking, that's going to be you <laughs> unless you have uh, you know, explicitly made some other arrangement. Um, and that brings into question the, the possibility of so-called empty legs, which can be a very good value proposition. Pear, perhaps you could help us out again. What do we really mean by an empty leg and why can that be a good thing? So yeah, very good, Charles. Because it is a very big distinction between one way where you're paying for a one-way routing and in that price they've included all the positioning and et cetera. But in an empty leg, that's the case when the aircraft actually have to go somewhere. So it's already committed, say that it's normal based in New York, but it's going to go down to Florida and pick up a passenger. So there is no return leg that needs to be priced in. Uh, the downside is that it's going to be very specific. It's not a scheduled charter, let's be clear on that, because I mean, there's flexibility on when and where you would go, but it's basically within a window of that day within these uh, parameters, and you can thereby get away with a cheaper cost than what you would have had otherwise. Yeah. So again, very important to understand what sort of flexibility you want and what constraints you, you you might be willing to impose on that flexibility in order to get a more advantageous price. So, you know, I think a lot of people starting out might assume, well, I'm booking this whole jet. I'm king of the world for the day. What I say goes when I say it goes. And, you know, the devil's in the detail on that sort of thing. And I think Michael's going to address this for us a little bit later on. I think ultimately it comes down to how much you want to shop around. OK, that's right. And if you're booking, um, let's say I want to go from here to Los Angeles and it's not a given because I know people have been, you know, they've flown there and then realize, oh, I actually just paid for this plane to return back to New York. 
yeah. with no one in it. Um, so that's a very important question to ask right off the bat. It really is. It really is. And the default position is usually that one way or the other, you are indeed paying for that return flight. Okay. Um, all right. Well, now we have a business aviation vocabulary break. And yeah. we've covered, but let's just go through these, Charlie, really quick. Yeah. So one way, I think we've covered that fairly well. That's something most people can understand. Empty leg, we now know, is essentially a, a flight that is just there to to move the aircraft you know back from where it came from or where it's got to go next and as per mentioned there are opportunities there to to grab one of those flights and perhaps get it at a better rate than would otherwise be the case provider this is one of those words that's just banded around and what on earth does it mean well in simple terms it means the service provider it means the person who is providing that flight and it's often interchangeable with the term operator uh, except that it's an operator is somebody who has a very specific legal responsibility for the aircraft and how it's flown and on what terms. And we're going to get into some of those legal uh, uh, distinctions a bit later. Certification. This means is this is this flight being provided by a company that is approved to actually do that? Um, in the case of aviation, you have to have approval. Usually in the in the US, it would be from the Federal Aviation Administration. Somewhere like Europe, it might well be from the European authorities. You've got to have an operator that's certified to operate commercially in an aircraft that is certified as being safe to do so. So that's what we talk about with certification. FBO, one of these horrendous acronyms that's been around <laughs> as long as private aviation. Uh, I'll, I'll break the mystique here. It simply means fixed-based operator, and you're going to say, what on earth does that mean? Not very much, really. Think of this as, as a building. Think of it as a private terminal. For you as the consumer, it just means usually a comfortable place for you to go and hang out for a little while before you get on your flight. But more importantly, it generally provides all the key services that the aircraft operators need, like gas, uh, usually some maintenance. You know, Often that's where the the meals and the beverages will get loaded from. It, think of it as a fancy gas station, to put it somewhat crudely. Basically a private airport. It's the airport. That's right? much better, Jen. I like that, a private airport. <laughs> yeah, and um, just quickly to go back, and I know we're gonna get into this more later, but when we talk about um, an aircraft being certified, is that something that a passenger should be worried about? Like, when do you get into trouble with that? Yeah, I, I think uh, probably the, the most important um, concern that a passenger should have is not so much, you know, is a given aircraft type certified or not? I mean, it would be extraordinarily unusual for, for an operator to be using an aircraft that wasn't certified at all. I think what's more important is, is the operator certified to provide that flight for hire? In other words, in exchange for money. And is the maintenance organization that that makes sure that the aircraft in question is safe and ready to fly certified to do that maintenance in other words are there any corners possibly being cut you know is this an operator that isn't really approved to do what it says it's going to do and is it perhaps not backed up by people who are approved to do what they've got to do uh, and this is one reason i have to say where for peace of mind you might well want to start with a broker because a good broker should make it his or her business to check all those boxes for you and not leave you worrying about it. Okay, excellent. Um, all right, so Mike, now we finally get to come to you, the actual passenger. Mike has um, many hours and lots of experience, mostly for business purposes, flying privately. Um, I don't know, Mike, because you maybe think back and remember the first time you flew privately, and I'm hoping we can get into your head a little bit and if you can remember, like, what were you worried about and how did it go and how did you get to the airport and then what did you do, et cetera? Well, I'll, I'll be very happy to answer those questions for you. Um, I was thinking about the, uh, the first charter trip that I took and I did arrange it through a broker. And he took me by the hand and led me through the process and he answered every question that I had. And we actually became pretty good friends after that. Uh, but I thought you might be interested in some of the questions that he asked me that I didn't know how to answer. Because I guarantee you, you'll get asked the same questions whether you talk to a broker 
or whether you're talking directly to the charter provider. And um, some questions you'll know the answer to, but one of the questions they're gonna ask you is, what time would you like to go? You've never been asked that question by an airline. And and the, and you'll stop it, it'll take you for a minute, it's like, well, how do I know when I wanna leave? I don't tell how long it takes to fly there. <laughs> so the way you answer that question is, tell them what you know. Well, what you know is, what time does work start when you arrive? So if you've got a big sales meeting uh, that starts at nine o'clock in your destination city, you wanna land 30 minutes before the meeting. So you tell your broker or your operator, my meeting starts at nine o'clock, I wanna be stepping out of the, air, of the airplane onto the ground at 8.30. Uh, you figure out what time we have to take off in the morning. And then as far as when you want to return, I'm, I like round trips uh, for all the reasons Charlie mentioned. So when you're planning your return, you have a pretty good idea what time you're going to be finished with business. Add 30 minutes to it to drive to the airport, and that's when you want to hear the door close and the engines fire up. So that's how you set the schedule, and then you let your operator figure out all the in-between times. A um, couple other questions they asked me. You'll love this one. Mr. Ryan, what airports would you like to use? I, I, I had no idea I had choices. <laughs> so if you've spent 2 million miles with the airlines like I have, uh, you pretty much know all the airports that the airlines use and you can probably name them by airline. But you're not really, ever, you've probably never given any thought to the fact that there are probably 10 times as many general aviation airports in the US as there are airports served by the airlines. So the answer to the question is, if you have an early morning departure, you want to depart from the airport closest to your house. And you want to land at the airport closest to your destination. So if I may use an example, if I were going to fly a round trip between Austin, Texas and Tulsa, Oklahoma, I actually fly out of the Georgetown Municipal Airport because that's closest to my house. And I wouldn't land at the uh, Tulsa International Airport. I'd actually land at Riverside because it's only 10 minutes from my usual destination. <laughs> so, uh, but you won't know the airports. So what you do is you simply tell your operator, well, I think I'd like to leave from home, so here's where I live. If you don't want to give them the street address, you just tell them generally where you live. And they'll tell you what airport is closest. And then you can tell them generally where your destination is if you don't want to give them the specific street address. And they can quickly look up which airport in the area is closest in the shortest drive time to where you're going. Um, is that too much? Is that too long? No, no, that's very good. Now, let's just clarify one point. You just mentioned general aviation airports. So just to be clear for people who don't know what we mean there, we're basically talking about airports that don't usually get used by airlines. And of course, the beauty of that is you're avoiding the, usually those air airports are closer to where you begin and end your journey, as you say, Mike, um, mm -hmm. but also they tend not to have crowds of people there. So that that's part of the right. magic as well. Perhaps you could just describe to people what it's like to actually, you know, pull up at a general aviation airport and, and transition to your flight by comparison with going through a big airport, because I think that's where some of the, the, the true secret sauce is. Okay, first of all, you'll get lost, okay? Uh, the, uh, the signage at general aviation airports and even at commercial airports uh, where, that have FBOs generally is not very good. So you, uh, my advice would be uh, talk to when it, whoever sets up your flight, whether it's the charter operator or the, um, or the broker, ask for the contact information for the FBO where you are going to catch the flight. And then ask them to either uh, te uh, text you or email you driving directions or the street address so you can put it into your GPS because the signage tends to be excellent on the airplane side of the building. It tends to be hideous on the parking lot side of the building. So uh, that would be my advice, especially if you're gonna be in a hurry. 
uh, in a, my very first charter flight. Go ahead. Um, I I just want to clarify because this is the FBO thing is so confusing. Um, let's give an example: Teterboro Airport. That's Teterboro Airport. That's where you fly out of privately. How many FBOs are there approximately, Charlie? Like, oh, it's a maybe? minimum half a dozen, I would say. Some, something oh, half like a dozen. Okay. So yeah. the FBO, it's a terminal, but they're all owned. And so, what are some examples of those? I know there's yes. Jet Aviation. Is yes, one in, yes, indeed. Yeah, there's there's several of them, and they all have different names. So to Michael's point, you've got to you've got to find out from your operator where exactly are we flying from. Because you don't want to be saying to the taxi driver, take me to Teterboro. And then, as you say, you get there and it's, well, which bit of Teterboro? Um, but just asking that question, exactly which FBO we're going to use is is so important. I agree. And, and to be specific. So once you pull up, let's assume that's gone OK and you found the airport, Michael. Another difference is you don't you don't walk into the building with a ticket and look for a check-in desk. What actually happens next? How, how do you connect with the people who are going to be flying you? Oh, this is very, this is very nice. You'll love this. Um, you, you walk in and there is generally a reception area, a desk, kind of like checking into a very nice hotel. Uh, and you can go up to the counter and announce who you are and uh, what your flight is that you're taking. You'll have some information your operator, or your provider gave you. Uh, generally, it's an identification for the aircraft and it's called the tail number. Um, and you can just tell them and they will say, oh, your pilots are already here. That's the, those are your pilots sitting right over there. Or they'll get on the intercom and they'll, they'll uh, request the pilot to come to the desk. Um, many times, particularly if it's not terribly busy, you'll, I have had the pilots waiting at the door for me when I walked in from the parking lot. Uh, I just happened to be the only passenger coming in at that particular time. There's happened to be the only aircraft sitting out there waiting for a passenger. Wasn't too hard to figure out who belonged to whom. Uh, yeah. So that actually turns out to be the most pleasant uh, and enjoyable uh, part of the ground experience. I would add one thing for you though. Uh, when you're planning your trip, if your broker or your operator asks you if you would like them to arrange your ground transportation at your destination. The answer is always yes, until you've had some experience. And the reason you want them to do it is if there's this, what they really do is they get a hold of the FBO at your destination and those people are arranging the ground transportation, but more importantly, they're monitoring your incoming flight. Uh, on various software tools. And if they see you're going to be delayed for any reason, they take care of making the adjustments with your ground transportation or with your family member or your business colleague who might be waiting there in the lobby for you to arrive and start to get anxious about one thing or another. So until you kind of learn the ropes, I would always allow them to make the ground transportation arrangements. And that's a good point. That's where this this you know mystery entity called the FBO actually adds some value with their mm -hmm. local knowledge and and with their follow up. That's a great point. So once you've identified which plane you're getting on, Mike, then you're going to meet, I guess, the pilots and and in some cases there would be flight attendants too for larger aircraft and longer flights. I mean, how's the interaction with those people? Because if you're flying airline, I mean, you're just barely on nodding terms with the with the the pilots and the flight attendants. Um, I have found, without exception. Uh, that the pilots and crew on charter aircraft are not only excellent at their profession of flying, but they are also very good interacting with the passengers. Uh, they're personable, they're friendly, they're not nosy. There's a fine line there. Um, and they, they, they stay just, they handle it beautifully. Uh, they'll answer your questions, they'll provide you good information. Uh, and you should feel entirely comfortable asking them anything you want to about the flight and about the rules of the road for on the airplane. So one of the things they'll do is give you a safety briefing. And I know it won't be like on the airlines, <laughs> but there will be a safety briefing. And after the safety briefing, that's when you can ask the questions that have to do with your particular aircraft and your particular flight. Uh, the questions I know you're going to ask. Um, am I allowed to get up and move around the cabin? The answer will generally be, well, yes, when the seatbelt sign is off and we don't leave it on very long. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. 
Now, whether or not you want to get up and move around the cabin has a lot to do with the kind of aircraft you're on, and I know we'll talk about that later. But yes, now, the other thing is, um, if you have any questions, uh, I would say don't talk to the pilots if they close the cockpit door. Mm -hmm. When the door is closed, it's what they call, uh, I forget the exact term, a sterile cockpit. Well, yes. what they really mean is that's when they're very busy. They're doing a lot of stuff on the radio. They're doing a lot of stuff flying the aircraft. Um, and so if they have the door closed or the curtain pulled, whatever the aircraft happens to be, that's generally their indication that please do not disturb, you know, for safety reasons. But once they're ready for to visit, they'll generally open the cockpit door and you can wander up front and kneel between them and look at whatever you want. The view out the front is phenomenal. <laughs> Uh, yeah. You definitely want to have a view out the front. It's your plane while you're on it. Go look out your front windows. Yes, yeah, especially since that's something you'll never get to do on an airliner these days, sadly. They're never get to do that. Not legally. <laughs> yes, that's true. Interesting, interesting. Now, um, Michael, how often have you kind of gotten on a on a on an airplane that you've booked, and sort of thought, oh, this isn't quite what I thought it would be. It's it's perhaps a bit smaller than I thought, and or have you ever had any surprises, either either pleasant or otherwise? And how does that inform your behavior as a consumer when it comes to making choices? Um, I've not been surprised by the interior of the aircraft or the size or anything like that. Uh, mostly because I had some experience in corporate life when I was a junior executive and the company for whom I worked had a flight department with three different kinds of aircraft. So I already knew what a King Air was, I already knew what a light jet was, and I already knew what a G2 was. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a G2 for the audience would be the sort of jet that you would see in movies and television, where people yeah. are standing up and strolling about the cabin, they're visiting back and forth between seats, there's a flight attendant, there's a galley. I don't rent those. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question that is just coming in that I, is a perfect segue. Is there a bathroom on board? Yes. Oh, that's a wonderful question. The answer is, well, maybe sort of. Mm -hmm. um, if you have, uh, now we're going to talk about the size of aircraft, but generally they're called light, uh, midsize, and heavy, okay, or large. Um, if it's a large cabin aircraft, meaning you can stand up and walk around comfortably, you don't have to bend over, your head's not touching the ceiling, there will be a lovely bathroom on board, nicer than anything you've encountered on any uh, commercial airliner. If you have to kind of lean over to walk through the cabin, and it's not the kind of cabin they show you on the movies, even if they show you the exterior of it, okay, there might be a bathroom but whether or not you want to use it is questionable and not because of cleanliness or anything like that but it, it's not what you're going to be used used to it may be considered more along the lines of an emergency escape route mm -hmm. so uh if if that is of importance to you and i must say as i age it becomes slightly more important um if that is of importance to you um, you want to have that conversation with the broker or the operator in the selection of the aircraft and in the length of the trip. Mm -hmm. So if you're going coast to coast and you want to go nonstop, you want to be in, a, in an aircraft large enough to have a walk-in, uh, walk uh, move around comfortably bathroom. Uh, if you're going to be on a 90-minute flight, you probably don't care one way or another. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So it, it has more to do with you and the length of the flight. Right, yeah. okay, great, that's a good point. Um, I wonder, Charlie, now, Per, can we, I, if we could just switch gears to you, um, will you tell us a little bit about your company, Avinode? Um, and I was, you, you have a lot of knowledge. I know it's, you, you aren't necessarily passenger facing, but um, I wanted you to give us some insight into some of the things that passengers really need to look out for when they're first booking a charter flight? What are some red flags? What, are, what do you recommend? Sure, very, very, would very much like to do that. And like everything else in this industry, there's a lot of stuff that happens behind uh, the scenes in order to, for a flight to take off. 
things that the passenger don't see. And, and Avenode is, is part of that behind the scenes in that we are have 90% of the world's brokers and operators tied up to our platform where you can go in as brokers and operators to market that you have aircraft, match up trips, uh, source one ways, et cetera. But we are basically business for business. And in one way, we are also providing content for the consumer in that most of the apps you see out there that are uh, allows you to book online, get parts or all of the content based on the data that we have, have provided. So, so I'm neither a broker and an operator, and I have so much respect for all the hard work that they need to do in order to get you flying. Mm -hmm. uh, so for us, I mean, there are quite a couple of important distinctions when we look at the industry. So, I mean, there are um, real charter, legal charter. That's when you have AUCs. You have a, in the US a part 135. The aircraft should be listed on a DU-85. And even when they fly the file, the flight plan, they should do that as a charter and not as an owner flight. I know that's a lot of acronyms, but I mean, there's the area of real legal charter. And then everything else is illegal. Yeah. Don't think case about it as yeah. gray charter you might hear in there, which is a friend of you has an aircraft that they let you borrow and you pay him on the site. That is illegal. You shouldn't touch it. So from an avenue perspective, we're very focused on just having shorter operators with legal certificate on the system. The, and yeah, that's one of those also, key distinctions on certification. That's one of those key distinctions. You just used the term there, AOC. Uh, it, it's very simple. A aircraft operator certificate, air operator certificate. It, it, if, if, a, if an operator doesn't have that, basically they shouldn't be flying you for hire. Is it that simple? Yeah, and it's something that's on top of their uh, desk, into the top of their, their folders on the computer. So if you ask and someone says, well, it will take me a day or two or, or to send it, that's a warning sign. I mean, it's, I mean they should be readily available uh, to provide that. There are even websites on the FAA where you can go in and see who has been issued a one certified certificate in, in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, the broker environment, I mean, they are like specialized travel agents. I think it's a good uh, comparison. It is a non-regulated environment. So, of course, here we only want to deal with professionals and, and then it goes through a checklist of, of uh, making sure that they mark themselves, uh, that there's a real business behind it. But that's sort of where it gets to be on our perspective. And, and yes, last month there were 100,000 trips sourced, maybe not booked, but tried to match in the Avenue system. So that's sort of the scale at which we operate. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, have you seen, just in your experience, is there any mistakes that you see passengers making in the beginning, like common yeah. mistakes? And I think that Michael really hit it on the head. I mean, first one is communication, right? It is, what do I want to accomplish? Where do I want to go? Assume that everything you know about air travel from travel and commercial doesn't hold true. Yes. <laughs> so, so it's no two hours ahead. It's 20 minutes. It's uh, easy to get on. I mean, it goes to where you need to uh, need to to be rather than the big airports. If you're shortering and it seems too good to be true, it usually is. I mean, don't get stuck on the price. I mean, start the conversation and you will distinguish the, the, the best brokers from the maybe not as great in the way that they portray themselves and that they are there to help your life being easier. They are not there to make their commission and disappear. They want to make sure that you have a great experience. Safety is number one. And we'll talk about Argus and Wyvern, but there are they, these uh, companies provide data on pilots so that brokers can vet them. So, so yeah. make sure that you really are clear on what you ask for, read the contracts, uh, don't assume anything, and don't be afraid to ask stupid questions. Okay. Very good advice. All right. And so actually, now this is Charlie, the part that everybody's been waiting for. We're going to get into some costs. Um, and these are obviously uh, not yeah. exactly. Take it away, no, Charlie. Absolutely. Yeah. So what, what we did here was just, just to give people some idea, um, uh, we we came up with a couple of of sort of hypothetical travel groups, and, and one here is is two people traveling strictly on business, and uh, we've basically priced out here a, a same day round trip option, which by the sound of it is something that uh, Michael might do, and then a one way trip uh, between two airports, um, and we've given some examples here of 
in a way what Michael alluded to, that you, you might be traveling from cities that don't have a major air transport, uh, airline airport, if you like, somewhere like Springfield, Illinois, for example. Uh, and the point is by using those, you can avoid a pretty long ground trip to whichever airport you'd have to use to, to, uh, to fly with the airlines. And you'll see that there are quite big variations here, uh, depending on the, the type of aircraft that you're choosing to use. So for example, let's look at this one between Springfield and Detroit, uh, you know, for a turboprop aircraft. So that's, that's the one with the propellers spinning at the front. You, that might be $9,500. And for a light jet, which might not really be that much larger, uh, it's basically a couple of thousand dollars more. So th these are the sort of breakdowns uh, that, that you'll find, the sort of spreads in terms of size of aircraft and range of aircraft that's available. And I think in most of these cases, it's worth to point out, this, it says two, if you were four, it would probably still be comfortable traveling. It's yes. not that it's going to be 22,800 in the first example. It's the price for the full aircraft. And these Thank are you. all very, inclusive very indicative yeah. pricing. Yeah. And this, and this I would, is where it becomes such a value proposition. Yes, Michael, over to you. And I would point out a couple of things very helpful on this table. Um, both a turboprop and a light jet generally carry six adults very comfortably. When people tell you how many seats there are on an aircraft, there are the comfortable ones and the not comfortable ones. <laughs> Uh, so uh, you, the fact that you are allowed to, they, it, you will see things like, oh, there's a seat belt in the bathroom. Well, technically that's a legal seat, but who wants to fly in it? Um, uh, there are the small side-facing couches on a lot of light jets and turboprops. Yeah, you could put two people on there, but they better really like each other. Um, uh, you want to know about how many captain's chairs or how many uh, club seating type chairs, you want to know how many real comfortable seats that tilt and swivel and move around are on the aircraft before you start thinking about whether it will hold everybody. The other thing is, notice in the third row of the table, if, if everybody can read that, the flight times. The turboprop takes an hour and 30 minutes. The light jets an hour and 10 minutes. For the difference in price, you're only saving 20 minutes in travel time. Mm -hmm. So notice that as you read across between the, the different size jets um, and the travel times, that's worth keeping in mind. Yeah, good point, especially since you're going to be getting to an airport that's that's almost certainly closer to where you need to end up. So, you know, that that 10 minutes could amount to next to nothing. That 20 minutes even could amount to next to nothing. OK, um, OK, this great. This is the large group, Jen. So this was for a yeah, family yeah. group, yeah. perhaps traveling on vacation. Uh, and as you can see, we've broken down several sample trips here. Um, but this is where the, you know, it the detail really does matter. Um, you know, I, if you're traveling with a family group, really important, I would say, to, to be clear as to what sort of baggage you're going to be taking with you. Uh, I think we've heard of some horror stories, haven't we, where, you know, a family showed up for, a, for you know, a, a family vacation and, and neglected to mention, oh, by the way, it's a skiing trip and we're going to have a bunch of heavy ski equipment that the operator wasn't ready for and hadn't factored into the size of the aircraft. So, Pear, would this be an example of where, frankly, you do need to be clear as to exactly what you're going to be traveling for and, and what you'll need with you? Yeah, uh, definitely. And even that you're charting a private jet, don't tell your cousin in the morning, join us at 1030. Because <laughs> if you show up with more people, there might yeah. be issues. I mean, A, they need to get you on the passenger manifest, so you're probably going to delay it at 30 minutes at, the, at least. Yeah. Uh, there might be that all of a sudden there's uh, you need to do a fuel stop or anything like that. Be communicating ahead of time uh, yeah. if you want to have that smooth experience. And, and brokers or operators, and just to be clear, most bro operators will help you out as well in, in case their fleet isn't available to find an alternative. So, so, but they should be communicating and you should be transparent what you want to achieve if you want to have a great experience. Right, and actually, um, there, there's we have a question coming in, um, and I just wanted to flag this up. Um, two things. One is, I mean, you can show up 20 minutes ahead of time, but you still need to show up on time, 
right? Like just because you have, you can't just show up, you can't be five hours late and expect to take off. And Michael, I think you once had a, you once told us an anecdote about a situation where you had sort of somewhat casually assumed that that plane was just going to be sitting there, you know, waiting for you to turn up. So I, I guess you learned the lesson that day that you have to be pretty specific. Yeah, I got lucky. Uh, we had booked a, a light jet from Atlanta to a, another city and uh, the, the flight left at one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, all of my previous charter trips had left first thing in the morning and were round trip. So I had the plane for the whole day. And I just got to thinking in terms of, I have the plane for 12 hours, which there's a regulatory thing around that. But as a rule of thumb, you've got the plane for 12 hours as a rule of thumb, but you have to check. I forgot to check. Well, as it turns out, I had the plane for 12 hours, but I only had the crew for six. Yeah. because they had flown earlier in the day and they have a maximum number of duty hours. So if the client where we flew to make the sales presentation had asked us to go to dinner, we would have been walking home. Oh, yeah. that's and, right. I think that, and I think that's a very good point, <laughs> especially now with the one-way operators that are flying and they tying trips together. That's how they are sometimes also compensate that you don't need to pay the return, right? You fly out to LA, well, they know that they have passengers from LA to Seattle. Then they'll have Seattle to Chicago. And over the course of three days, the aircraft made its way back to New York. Those business models only sh works if people show up on time. So read mm -hmm. your terms and conditions. They will give you some leeway. But if you're an hour late, the contract says they have the right to take off and you're not getting any refunds. Mm -hmm. Okay, good point. Um, and then what about in the, the case of, let's say there's a snowstorm and you can't fly out or there's a mechanical issue with the aircraft, how is that handled? Do they, they a good operator will take care of that for you or broker, right? They'll um, make sure that you get to where you need to go or they should? They will try as much as they possibly can to make sure that you get to the destination and where you need to be. There's some stuff that no one influences. Weather, okay, we'll not get you into Aspen if there's a snowstorm. They will reroute you to somewhere else and make sure them to provide accommodations. Uh, or for that matter, maybe transportation if that's an option. You could have a case where there's a, you booked a mid-size and it broke, but the operator has a heavy jet that they will actually fly you in without the price difference. Or that the broker sources an aircraft from someone else. And the only thing I would make sure then as a consumer is that you ask to have the same due diligence being done, the same information that you were originally provided about the operator and the pilots about this new one. But, but trust me, from behind the scenes, the work that a lot of people to put in uh, to, to solve it for you, when things go wrong, those planes break. It's, it's amazing. They're trying to do their utmost and not leave you hanging. Right. And, and I think it's important to keep in mind, especially when considering pricing, that safety is utterly paramount. You know, just because it's a different type of aviation, the safety equation is absolutely the same. And you really need to trust the professionals involved, the pilots and, and the people behind the aircraft to to do what is what is safe and what is legal. And, you know, the fact that you're chartering the entire plane doesn't buy you the right just to completely waive safety restrictions. And frankly, right. you shouldn't want that to happen. Yeah, and Charlie, you actually one time described it as, you know, you hire the best doctor in the world and then tell them how to do the surgery. So I think that is important to point out that, yeah. you know, listen to your pilots. Yeah, they know what they're exactly. doing and they have your, your life is at stake. Yeah, absolutely. The very first time I ever fly with any um, pilot, uh, I take the captain aside and I tell him before I get on board, there's absolutely nowhere I need to be at any particular time that would interfere with safety. Don't worry about my schedule. Mm -hmm. And we've never had the slightest problem in 20 years. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they appreciate hearing that. That's good. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, okay, well, so just back to costs, there are sometimes some unexpected costs. Some of them are necessary some of them aren't. So I just wanted to flag these up for um, our viewers today. 
Um, Charlie, can you maybe go through some of these? Yes, absolutely. So some of these are what I would call technical issues, things things that have to be done to make the flight safe. One of those would be de-icing. You know, other services are things that are somewhat discretionary, like how much use you're going to make of Wi-Fi, what sort of catering you're going to have. You know, is it is it just a simple sandwich or, you know, unlimited caviar and champagne through the flight? But regardless, it's very, very important that you're clear with the operator who's providing your flight on what is included in the price that you've been quoted and what would be billed for as extras uh, you know after the flight that could potentially give you a surprise and michael in your experience is it is it absolutely necessary to explicitly ask questions and say hey if i want to go wild and just watch unlimited streamed movies for four or five hours am i going to be billed more for that do, do you have to be proactive on these potentially hidden costs do you think well, I would say if you're kind of new to it and, you, and you're not even familiar with what the potential hidden costs could be, I would take the all-encompassing approach. I would get the final quote, and then you will be provided a written quote to approve before the trip, and you will often be asked to send payment before the trip, and that may be covered later. But when you've got that quote, the question you want to ask is, what other costs could possibly come up that would not be covered by this quote. Where could I be surprised? Or is this firm and I'm this is what I'm going to pay, no more and no less, and then wait for the answer. Yeah, good, good point. Uh, Pear, in your experience, um, is it fair to say that the the better operators, the more professional operators, would kind of anticipate what some of the additional costs should be and perhaps bring those to the attention of the consumer. I mean, it's sometimes it's obvious. If you're flying to Fargo, North Dakota in the middle of January, I think it's a fair assumption that de-icing might be part of the equation, but sometimes it might be less obvious. Do, do, do you think uh, consumers can count on operators to, to anticipate these and, and be transparent about it? I think that, that uh, you'll find that people are trying to be as transparent as possible. No one has anything to gain that once you touch down, it turns out that one of the kids' iPad was on and they was leaving there screaming YouTube, and all of a sudden the aircraft owner has a $2,500 bill. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're going to ask the client to pay that. So, so it's in everyone's interest to be transparent, uh, it's, uh, but of course you are at times not sure if the message was received. So recommendation, do have a look at the contract and have, a, I mean, cancellation policies is key. Ancillary uh, incidental costs are key. Uh, and then, of course, the routing that shows up on your itinerary. I mean, yeah. it happens. And I know when people put in the wrong airport codes and, and, and you signed off on that, then you're surprised you end up at the wrong airport. Yeah, uh, true, true enough. Uh, Michael, with something like catering, in your experience, is, is it a given that a sort of basic amount of catering, whether it's just a, a chilled soda and some pretzels will be included or, you know, does it become quite a complex sort of uh, menu item that has to be selected ahead of time? Um, every aircraft I've ever been on has basic um, beverage selections and snack selections, and there's never been an extra charge for that. Um, now, what you should be asked somewhere in the planning for your trip is, do you have any particular food or beverage requirements? Um, Mrs. Ryan has likes to have hot tea when she flies, and almost no aircraft have hot water on board, unless you ask for it ahead of time. They may have hot coffee, but they don't necessarily have a carafe of hot water. Um, but they're more than happy to put it on, and there's no ever never been an extra charge for it. Um, if you have a particular, uh, if you like alcoholic beverages you're, and you want some on the flight home, um, your operator may or may not include some at no extra charge. So that's something you want to check out. Uh, but as far as food, as opposed to snacks, uh, food always costs extra. Yeah. Good point. So just just be clear on that. And we we're and, mentioning. And don't be surprised. Sorry, don't be surprised at what the pricing is being shown. Mm -hmm. uh, a cheese sandwich will easily run in fifty dollars, and that's not that they're trying to to like make money on the cheese sandwich. It's just 
I mean, everything gets custom made and it's not the mass production, right? So it needs to go from a kitchen to the FBO, be at the FBO, and, and then of course, tailored to you, put on the right plane, et cetera. So, so catering can become expensive. Yeah, or but cheap, at least. You, you can save a lot of money. <laughs> and here's how, if, if we have time. Go ahead, yeah. Oh, well, I was t I took a jet once from Austin, Texas up to Indianapolis and I it was an early morning flight and I wanted to have breakfast on board. Well, the the pilot uh, who was taking care of that took a look at what it would cost to cater breakfast. And he told me when I got on board, Mr. Ryan, we did not cater your breakfast. My wife went out and got some for you. <laughs> and and I had a better breakfast from what she picked up for me at the grocery store uh, for about 10 bucks than I would have for the $50 breakfast that the flight uh, kitchen was going to charge up in Dallas before the plane came down to Austin to pick me up. Uh, and when Mrs. Ryan and I fly, we just bring our own sandwiches and stuff aboard because if you're in a turboprop or a light jet, the best you can hope for for catering, whether you do it yourself or have it done, is is a box lunch or something on a platter there's there's no flight kitchen on board there's no galley on board so if you're going to end up eating out of a box lunch or a platter anyway maybe you just stop at panera bread on the way to the airport and pick up your lunch good um, tip on, on possible possible unexpected costs a good question just came in jen i just saw somebody's asking about tipping and that yeah, really I'm just going mind. to mention that. Um, because you, yeah, here you are in this I mean, situation with pilots. Flying and we have some things to go through, but I mean, um, I, I know that tipping, that's not something that people want to have to worry about, but I mean, generally, Pear, do you think it's a good idea to tip the crew? Or is not is it appreciated but not expected? And Mike, what what have what is your... Because I do think sometimes in a situation like this, you don't know... Mm -hmm. Am I supposed to tip these pilots? They've done such an amazing job, or is that included? Well, my view on this is my view on this has changed over the years. Um, I actually wrote in an article once not to tip the pilot, and I heard from many pilots. <laughs> uh, but I heard both both sides of it. I, I heard from as many who agreed with my position as disagreed. I think what you want to think of in terms of the way Jennifer presented it is exactly right. Um, feel free to give an appropriate gift uh, money uh, to your crew if they've done something that, you know, really made you happy. Uh, but tipping in the sense of like tipping at a restaurant in terms of like a percentage no, no, nobody expects that. Uh, n nobody does. But everybody appreciates uh, something that shows your appreciation uh, for what they've done for you. Uh, but it's entirely up to you, and it's really flight by flight. Yeah, good point. Good point. And it could be how someone at FBO could have gone above and beyond in mm -hmm. servicing your accommodations. I mean, maybe you forgot something somewhere and they ran and, and, and bought it or, or figured something out, so. Yeah, good point. Jen, just quickly on cost, very quickly, two other points on this list are, you know, whether you had one pilot or two pilots or a flight attendant, you know, again, these are assumptions that people might make because they're used to there being two pilots in an airliner, they're used to there always being flight attendants. But Pea, from your point of view, are, are these things that are maybe not just a given, that in some cases it's perfectly legal to have one pilot, so you better speak up if you really want to have two, and there could be extra costs there. Is that a factor? I mean, there are certain scenarios where you could have single pilot operations. And then, of course, you could ask for it to be with two pilots. In most mm -hmm. cases, with what the 175 flighting uh, that we're doing, it, it's always going to be two pilots. You could, and some people do, have a restriction that they want a minimum of, of two captains uh, rather than a captain and a co-pilot. There are some people that will always say that they also want X number of flight hours as a minimum. And, and if you require that, then it might be that it's a yes, certain aircraft or certain operator you could fly with, you're sort of shrinking the pool. Uh, and those would be, be at additional cost. A flight attendant, I mean, not all aircraft have the capability to bring a flight attendant along. I mean, if it's a light and a mid-size, I mean, there, there is I mean, no real uh, reason. If you have a heavy jet, I mean, an ultra-long range, yes, there will be a flight attendant in most cases. 
and that will come at an additional charge. Fair but it's enough. going to be spelled out on the quote and, and bundled in. And I think that nowadays what you're going to start seeing is that you get a total price rather than different breakdowns. I mean, if you go back five, six years ago, it would be a list line item out of everything. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't charge you what it said there. They would charge you based on how many flight hours they actually had in the air. Now people are saying, here's the price. We'll get you from A to B for this price. Mm -hmm. Good point. Okay, great. Oh, wait, we have another BizAv vocab break. Um, Excellent. Quickly, let's just go through these. Yeah. Uh, what's the cell number, Charlie? Tail number. Okay, so that's how you identify the specific aircraft that you're on, and it's often used as a reference by the operator. It, it think of it like a the, the tag on a car. It's it usually will begin. Well, it always I think will begin with a letter which identifies the country that you're in. So if we're talking the United States, it's always going to have an N in front of it, and then it will have a number that's the registration. Uh, we've got a reference here to NetJets. So that's a very uh, famous company in the private aviation sector, and they provide uh, options such as fractional ownership, which is a way of essentially owning a share of a nominal aircraft that gives you a right to fly a certain number of hours at a certain price over the course of a year. And they also provide jet card service, which is basically where you agree to buy a certain number of hours for usually a preferential rate. Right, and we. I just wanted to put NetJets up here because the brand is so widely known, but they're Absolutely. not. Absolutely, there NetJets. are plenty of other good companies providing uh, variations on that theme. That's just a, an easy reference point. Wyvern and Argus, these are great companies. They basically provide a service where they're auditing the safety and quality of the of the operator, but most importantly, the safety. And this is a way that you can be certain that over and above the, the, the legal requirement to be certified in a certain way that these companies have an established set of safety practices that they're sticking to consistently. Uh, and in fact, the, the slide we've got up now, this reference is something that Argus provides. It's called a trip check. Um, and Pear, perhaps you could explain this to us. What, what does this tell us and why is it a good thing if you're a consumer to see this? Yeah, so, so what Argus and Wyvern do is to have operators provide them with information about the, the pilots they have uh, on the roster, uh, updates on their pilot's flight hours, um, last time they did the medical, sim training, etc. Uh, and if you're working with a Wyvern broker or an Argus broker, that means that they are running for every trip. They put in the details. So in this case, uh, we see there's a flight departing July 25th. Where we see at the top that it, when it was run, an ID for this trip check, you will see the name of the operator. There could be cases when you have booked with company A, but, but it's operated by another certificate name. All of that information should be there. And then further down, you have what's called PIC and SIC. It's written out, pilot in command. In other words, the captain. Second in command, co-pilot. You'll see, do they have the right certificate? How many hours do they have? total, in this case, 23,900. How many hours as pilots? And what is the aircraft and what's the tail number? And if someone cannot provide you this instantly, very easily, okay, then you should probably start asking additional questions. Yeah, so and it's a quick reference point. And will be online that you can reference at, so if they switch the name of the pilot, then you will see that in real time. Your okay. broker operator should send you a new trip check uh, or a pass report with the updated information. Okay. You will know tail number ahead of time, because that's of course how you reference it, and you should know your pilot and SIC as well. Okay, great. Um, all right, so we unfortunately are running out of time. Um, I did want to, we, we do have the article that Mike wrote that we were going to get into and we've run out of time, but um, where he really goes into six more questions that every passenger should be asking, but we will provide that with the, um, when we provide the slides, I will also provide a link to that and some other materials um, on, that we have here at Business Jet Traveler. And I just wanna end with this quote from Mark Cuban um, and to emphasize again to everyone, the most important thing we've learned today, if, if you remember nothing else, just remember to ask a lot of questions. Ask the stupid questions, ask questions over and over again. Um, I think that flying privately is such an important business tool that it's a shame to not take that first flight, 
even if you feel kind of uncomfortable about asking questions or getting the details, um, it will be worth it for you personally and especially for your business. So um, in closing, I would like to thank Pear and Mike and my colleague Charlie so much for joining us. And I would like to thank all of you in the audience for taking the time to join us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will be sending you a bunch of materials tomorrow. And um, if you want to learn even more about flying privately, you can subscribe to our newsletter, BJT Waypoints. That comes out, came out this morning, comes out on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We also have a Business Jet Traveler Buyer's Guide. And um, we look forward to seeing you in the future at our future webinars. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you.